Hello everyone. In this lecture we're going to be talking a little bit about what a study sample is and how researchers go about deciding who they'll be including in the study. We'll also discuss a little bit about why this is actually important to the overall findings of that study. So this lecture is going to be in two parts. In part one we're talk going to talk about how researchers develop criteria for a study and in part two we're going to talk about different types of sampling techniques that researchers use. So what is sampling? Well, in research, you, tip, you have a population that you want to describe. Say you want to describe R and BSN students in the entire country and get some idea about what R and BSN students are experiencing. Well, the truth is, is you can't talk to every single R and BSN student in the United States. Uh, what you can do is have a certain accessible population. So an accessible po po population might be the group of R and BSN students who are, say, currently in school across the United States. Uh, and then within that group, you might even just only have the accessible population in terms of people that you could reasonably access by communicating with their university that they're studying at. Um, the researcher is going to have to find a certain subset of that accessible population that they actually will do a survey with, and that is going to be their actual sample. So a researcher goes through the process of selecting out from their overall population a particular group of people that they'll be working with, and then once they get the results, they try and make some sort of argument as to the extent to which that sample can be generalized to the uh, to understanding the larger target population that they wanted to study to begin with. So this is a tension within research of of identifying a, popu a sample population that makes sense, uh, in order to answer their question, at the same time as uh, having it be generalizable enough that you can actually use it to understand their overall question. All right. So let's imagine that I'm a researcher and I want to understand more about how nurses think about uh, obtaining a BSN and how important that is. So I'm going to ask this class a question, and the question is, do you agree that patients would be better served if nurses were required to obtain the BSM before taking the NCLEX RN exam? And you can either agree, somewhat agree, have no opinion, somewhat disagree, or disagree. So um, obviously this is an online recording, but I've actually done this in class before. And the overall majority of classes, when I ask them this, uh, select five, which is disagree. Now. Um, if we were to ask all nurses, um, would that be the case? Um, well, maybe, maybe not. The truth is, is that this sample, the group of people I'm talking to, are people who are here in the RN to BSN program. You're interested in getting a BSN, so you have some belief that that's something important. But there's also the fact that you're already, uh, most of you are practicing nurses, nurses who have an RN already, and uh, you've had the experience of working without having a BSN already. So uh, it's quite possible that you as a sample are somewhat biased in terms of your answer to this question and that, that the answers that you give in this class may or may not be representative of what all nurses would think. So um, this is an example of why samples are actually really important who you talk to to get your answers is going to determine what your results are. And if you try and make broad claims about nurses in general based upon, for example, what I found in this class, that may or may not be an appropriate generalization. So I just gave you one example of this. I want to give you another example to really illustrate how important it is to have an appropriate sample in your research study. So this is a historical example. Um, basically, uh, prior to World War One and during World War One, um, there was an interest in having intelligence te intelligence tests to help determine who would take on leadership versus support roles in the army, and this is the, uh, called the Yerkes uh, World War One Army Tests. So, uh, what they did is they designed an intelligence test. Um, which they took, uh, basically Yerkes was a uh, professor at, at, I believe, Yale. Uh, so he designed an intelligence test. Uh, uh, there were two different tests. One was designed for people who were literate and one was designed for people who were Ill illiterate. And uh, he took this test and he tried it out in a population. And the population, the sample that he used, was middle and upper class white participants. Many of them were, I believe, students actually at, um, uh, at Yale, I believe it was. 
So anyway, they tested out this um, this uh, this uh, intelligence test and uh, decided that it was a good test, and they started applying it uh, uh, in the process of recruiting uh, soldiers for, for the army in World War I. And they administered about 200,000 of, the, of these tests every month. So it made a huge impact on the recruitment process and making decisions about what role people would play in the army. All right, so let me show you some of the questions from this test. Well, um, here's three of them. Um, one was, 500 is played with A, rackets, B, pins, C, cards, or D, dice. Another one was, Becky Sharp appears in A, Vanity Fair, B, Romola, C, The Christmas Carol, and D, Henry IV. And the third question is, the Pierce Arrow car is made in A, Buffalo, B, Detroit, C, Toledo, and D, Flint. All right. So these are all questions that are designed to measure people's intelligence. Um, and we're all intelligent people in this class. So um, how are we doing with, with answering these questions? Well, um, I will tell you that I actually couldn't answer any of these questions myself. I'm imagining that probably most of you couldn't answer it either, but um, uh, I, I don't know that for sure. Um, the answers are, of course, um, C, uh, cards, uh, A, Vanity Fair, and A, Buffalo. Now, why, why am I pointing out these questions? Well, these are questions that someone at the time that this, that this uh, test was designed might very well have understood if they were part of a middle to upper class white population, uh, especially uh, in a certain region of the country. However, people, if you look across our entire country, um, which is the population to which this test was applied to, um, this may or may not have been something that they would be aware of, or and certainly it probably would not be an indicator of how intelligent they were. Now, the fact that uh, the researchers who originally designed this saw this as being uh, something that could be included is that a certain proportion of the people that they administered this original test to in their sample actually could answer these questions. All right, let me give you another example. This is a test that was designed to be for people who uh, could not read. To, de to determine intelligence. And, and the idea of this test was that people would draw in the things that were missing from each of these pictures. Now, some of these things may be uh, fairly broadly understood so that uh, someone might understand that the picture number two, someone should draw in an eye for that, or number three should draw in the nose. But there are other things, for example, 15 and 16, where you see someone bowling or playing tennis, where certain po populations in the United States may actually never have encountered that and therefore might not be able to answer it. Uh, again, suggesting that the sample that was used in the study was not representative, and therefore that may, may not have resulted in the appropriate test uh, to be used. So what were the consequences of this? Um, now, there are a lot of problems with this test that Yerkes put together. Uh, it's not just the sample, the original sample size. It's also uh, a data collection issue as well, which we'll talk about later. But um, what impact did this have? Well, it actually had a huge impact on our society. Well, for one, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, in terms of direct impacts, uh, the people who score well on this test tend to be middle and upper class white uh, individuals, so they tend to take on leadership roles where the other groups tend to be assigned to service positions in the army. So this led to a s significant disparity in in um, how the army was composed. Um, but it also had some fairly widespread impacts. So this all this data that was that was produced showing that there's difference between differences between groups, socioeconomic and racial groups, based upon intelligence. Uh, was then used in the 1924 Immigration Act, which was a very punitive act, which essentially uh, dramatically restricted immigration from countries that weren't Anglo-Saxon. Um, 
It was also used in the eugenics movement, which is uh, which was trying to improve the American stock, essentially by a, a wide number of different social values. And part of what they did there was to actually sterilize people who they saw as being unfit to reproduce. And the vast majority of people who were sterilized were uh, minority groups and people who uh, were of lower socioeconomic status. Uh, it was also used in racist propaganda uh, for a long time after this after this study was done, uh, showing that suggesting that th there was difference in intelligence with, between groups, even though this was a totally faulty test. And uh, Nazis used this information as part of their argument that uh, uh, that there was a Aryan supremacy based upon the data in the study, uh, which obviously led to a huge range of of terrible things. So, uh, so this is a very dramatic example where choice of a sample led to entirely inaccurate results, which had major social uh, consequences. But it is just an illustration of how important samples can be in terms of determining uh, research results. So let's talk a little bit about what sampling is. Well, sampling, again, is defined as a process of picking out a portion or a subset of a, a larger designated population. And it's, uh, try, it's, there's an attempt made to try and understand the extent to which this subset, the sample, represent, actually represents that entire population. Now, a sample is made up of elements uh, of that population. That's the basic unit about which information is actually collected. All right, so what is a population? Well, we've already talked about this a bit already, but it's a certain well-defined set uh, that includes certain properties. So uh, in most cases, for clinical research, it's going to be people. Um, but it could also be other uh, gr groups. It could be uh, animals, or it could be uh, certain sets of objects even, or even certain clinical events, for example. So uh, the point here is just that it, it has to be well-defined, whatever that it happens to be. Now, sample elements, uh, as I mentioned previously, are the units of the population that are being addressed. So if the population you're addressing is uh, people, it's going to be individual people within that population. For example, nurses might be the elements of your sample. If it's places, it might be, for example, uh, specific hospital units. So uh, this unit in this particular hospital. If it's objects, it might be uh, the unit of measurement might be uh, emergency supply stations. So if you're studying emergency supply stations, in general, each one is going to be your unit of measure. All right, so how do you actually go about defining a population in the study? Well, typically when you read through the methods section, there's going to be some criteria that will be laid out there. Um, and this will be often termed as inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. Now, inclusion criteria is the traits that a participant needs to have uh, in order to be included in the study, and exclusion criteria is the traits or characteristics that would make someone inappropriate for a, a sample. Now, very often they're used similarly, and sometimes they will only state one or the other. Uh, the reason for this is if, if you flip around an exclusion criteria and just state it differently, you could also describe it as an inclusion criteria. Uh, the point being here overall is that the study should have a very clear description of what they use to decide who or who, who would not be included in the, in the study. And uh, they should also typically have a justification for why they made those decisions. Uh, because that often is very important for understanding what the actual findings of that, of that study are. So what types of criteria would one use? Well, it depends on the study that you're doing. You're going to pick out different types of information that's relevant to picking a group of people that could appropriately answer the question that you're, that you're dealing with. Uh, so common criteria are listed here. For example, uh, socioeconomic status might be relevant if you're looking at something where you're looking at health disparities, for example. So you might be, want to be looking at a specific, specific groups of people in that sense. Um, or if you're looking at a specific health condition, it might be the case that you require that they have a certain diagnosis in order to be included in your study. So let's look at an example of uh, criteria for a study.
All right. So imagine that you're doing a study which looks at how uh, children experience pain uh, in the context of their treatment for leukemia during the first year after diagnosis. Um, so if you're doing this, what would be reasonable criteria to include for that study? Well, first off, you might want to say something about the age. So what, what are you consider who are you considering to be children in this context? You also might want to be clear about what your actual um, diagnosis is. So you would want, uh, in this case, the, the researchers wanted it to be acute lympho lymphocytic uh, le leukemia, where the, the participant has had a diagnosis with, uh, within one month. You could also say, all right, we really want to focus in on the impact of leukemia. So we, we want the child to have no other existing chronic conditions. Uh, that may influence the results in the study. Or we may want, not want them to have any cognitive disabilities so that we can't uh, effectively communicate them to understand what their experience has been. We also might say, all right, in the context of this study, it's going to require some, some effort from that child. So we want to make sure that the child has emotional ability to cope with the burden of doing this research in the study. And uh, in the study, you might want to say, okay, well, we want to restrict this based upon language. We only have people who can speak English and Spanish among our research team, so we're going to restrict this study to, to people who speak either one of those two languages. So uh, it's very important to clearly lay out your, your criteria because this allows people who are looking at your study to understand who was included and who was excluded in your study. And have some idea as to why you chose those different exclusion and inclusion criteria based upon what you're trying to do in your research.